Professor Dave here. Let's look at indefinite integrals. He knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. We now know how to evaluate definite integrals by evaluating antiderivatives over a specific interval. But sometimes we will be looking at integrals with no limits of integration listed. These are called indefinite integrals. The main difference is that definite integrals are numbers, like the area under a curve for a specific interval. But indefinite integrals, because there is no specified interval over which to evaluate, are actually functions or families of functions. This may seem totally different than what we have described integration to be thus far. But if we think about it, with definite integrals, we were simply evaluating the antiderivative over some arbitrary interval. If that interval can be literally anything, and we can compute absolutely any definite integral from the antiderivative, then it follows that the antiderivative, the function itself, is the integral of the integrand in the truest sense. In short, we started off wanting areas under curves and found that we could get these from antiderivatives. So we're now just considering the antiderivatives themselves. Since indefinite integrals still involve the same process of finding the antiderivative that evaluating definite integrals requires, it won't be that much different. But there are some important things to mention regarding indefinite integrals. So let's go over these now. As we said, indefinite integrals are ones with no limits of integration indicated. This means that it won't be evaluated to get a number, but rather we are integrating some function, f of x, to find some new function. This new function will be any antiderivative of f of x, which we can call uppercase f of x, such that big F prime will equal f of x. We must make sure to understand that when we say any antiderivative of f of x, this is because there are indeed infinitely many functions that qualify as antiderivatives. Because although the part of the antiderivative with the variable must be a certain way, we can also include any constant whatsoever. 1, 10, pi, a billion, any real number. This is because when we take the derivative of this function, any constant will simply go away, leaving us with f of x. So if we are integrating x squared, we will get x cubed over 3, as we expected, but we also write plus c, meaning that any constant may be present. We didn't care about this when we were evaluating definite integrals because whatever this constant is, it would be present when evaluating at both the upper limit and lower limit, which means it will simply subtract and therefore not affect our result. But if we are looking at indefinite integrals where we are simply writing a function, the notion of this constant does indeed become relevant and we must write it. Just to clarify one more time, when we take the derivative of this antiderivative, x cubed over 3 becomes x squared, as expected, and the constant will go away, giving us the original function. So truly, any constant could have been present. The properties of indefinite integrals will be precisely the same as those for definite integrals that we already went over. So just to review, the integral of a constant times some function will be equal to the constant times the integral of the function. So make sure to remember that constants can be pulled out of integrals. Let's also recall that integrals of sums and differences can be split up into sums and differences of integrals, and this property will be very useful in certain circumstances. The integral of a constant with respect to some differential, like k dx, will always be the constant times the variable, like kx here, and then plus c, for the reasons we mentioned earlier. And lastly, the property you will be using most frequently, the integral of x to the n dx, will be equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. Remember, this is just the precise opposite process of taking a derivative, so that taking the derivative of the integral gives us back our original function, just as the fundamental theorem of calculus demands. 
We have already practiced finding antiderivatives of polynomials when we used them to evaluate definite integrals, so just one or two practice examples should be enough. Let's try root x times the quantity x minus 2. To be clear, there is no product rule for integration, so this won't work the way we are looking at it. We have to express this some other way. What if we change root x into x to the 1 half, and then distribute that across this other term? That would give us x to the 3 halves minus 2 x to the 1 half. This may look a little less appealing, but it doesn't matter because now it is possible to find the antiderivative. So this is the way we have to go. 3 halves plus 1 is 5 halves, so we get x to the 5 halves over 5 halves, or 2 fifths x to the 5 halves. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves, so for this term we get minus 2 times x to the 3 halves over 3 halves, or 2 times 2 thirds x to the 3 halves, which is 4 thirds x to the 3 halves. And lastly, as we discussed, if this were a definite integral, we could just evaluate this antiderivative over the limits of integration, in which case we don't have to worry about a constant, because any constant would disappear during the subtraction. But as this is an indefinite integral, we do indeed have to write plus c at the end of this, because any constant can be here, and this expression would be valid. How about another one? 1 over e to the negative x plus 1 over 3x. At first glance, this seems complicated, but it's actually quite straightforward. First, since this is the integral of a sum, let's break it up into a sum of integrals to make things easier. Then, looking at the first one, if e is being raised to a negative exponent and is in the denominator, let's just bring it up to the numerator and make the exponent positive. That will be e to the x. Then for this other term, this is the same thing as 1 third times 1 over x. From here to integrate, we just have to remember a couple things about the derivatives of special terms. When we looked at the derivatives of logarithmic and exponential functions, we learned the incredible fact that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. It is the only function that does not change upon differentiation. But that means that if the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, then the integral of e to the x is also e to the x. Whether we are going up or down on the latter, e to the x doesn't change. So when finding this antiderivative, we can leave e to the x as it is. Then for this other one, we must recall that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. That also means that the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. So this integral will be 1 third ln x. And lastly, we add the constant c at the end. So sometimes we will have to identify special terms like these when integrating. That e to the x remains e to the x is easy to remember. That 1 over x becomes natural log of x isn't so obvious, as x to the negative 1 seems like it would follow the regular rule we use for any other exponent, but it is indeed the one exception to that rule. We don't get x to the 0 over 0, as that would be undefined. Instead, we get natural log of x, so you'll have to memorize this one and get used to spotting it within a more complicated function. So we should now understand the difference between definite and indefinite integrals. Both involve taking the antiderivative of a function, but a definite integral will evaluate that antiderivative at the upper and lower limits of integration, subtract them, and give a definite answer for the area under the curve over this particular interval. So a definite integral is a number. An indefinite integral will not be a number, but rather a function, the antiderivative of the integrand with the constant c listed, so that this function represents all the possible antiderivatives. We have practiced evaluating definite and indefinite integrals for polynomials, but there are many other types of functions we will have to integrate, so let's look at some of those next. But first, let's check comprehension.
Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com. Thank <laughs> you.